Uh, welcome back, and today we're going to talk about where to get started in Lab 7. Uh, lab 7 is going to be fun, and I've got a lot of, this is sort of an advice lecture, uh, an overview lecture, where does it all fit together. Um, I want you to think about your future during, during this week. I want you to think about what is it you want to have on your resume if you're going out to get a job. Uh, what is it you want to, what do you want to write about in your grad school application? Uh, what do you want to post on the internet for the world to believe you are? And I want you to embed a little bit of that into your choice of your project. Now there are uh, uh, three websites here. that uh, there are three websites here which have some uh, examples of things that previous students have done. Uh, this, uh, this is sort of what, this is sort of the outcome of, of when you get the end of Lab 7. And this is obviously from spring 2012. Uh, we used a smaller processor, but you can see that what they did is they had games, they had uh, uh, things that did things. Okay, let's look at another one. Look down these uh, spreadsheets to see what other people have done. So that's one way to um, one way to to tell uh, is to look at what other people have done. Okay. Games are popular because they're easy to understand. Uh, they're sort of uh, they're not necessarily the best thing to go on your grad school application. Something a like more grad school application things are. Are, are measuring things or doing something that's valuable. And so if you're interested in communications, uh, put a little communications in there. If you're interested in uh, circuit design, put some circuit, design some circuits. Okay? Uh, make it look like you've done something interesting. Uh, obviously it has to have a microcontroller, this 445L, um, but and I'm a medical guy, so there's lots of, uh, there's lots of medical applications you can do. Okay? Um, the other outcome of Lab uh, 7, 8, and 11 will be a web presence. And so I charge you at this point to think about what happens when you Google your name. I mean, <coughs> what, what, what is the world going to see when they look you up? And if you market yourself right, you can have that internet posting onto things that you want to brag about. Well, brags. You want people to to realistically know what you're good at. So I'd encourage you to, to think about that uh, as you create, as you post your stuff on blogs, you make wikis, YouTubes, etc. cetera. Okay. And so um, let me give you an overview of what, just, what we're doing here, okay? Lab six was just practice, okay? Now, you didn't really design anything. All you did was take one thing you already designed, the alarm clock or the music player, and you did layout. And you, the outcome of lab six is you created a piece of paper. And that piece of paper goes in a box. Okay? And then we toss it. Okay? We don't do anything with that paper. What we're going to do here in lab seven is now we're going to do a design. We're going to do, uh, and if you, and it's in Lab 7 that you create what it is, the requirements document. Uh, what are its inputs? What are its outputs? What does it do? Okay. And the layout. Okay. So you see in Lab 7, you have the, both, the, both the physical part of it, what boxes it go into, what, what, um, uh, what circuits go on your board, what processor you use. Um, but it, it's also the layout of the PCB. And so the outcome of Lab 7 okay, is you're going to send me a file that's got a PCB in it. Okay? You're going to send me a file, a PCB file, and we're going to buy it. Okay? And Daryl Goodnight and Mark Inman are going to run it through the oven and put the processor on it. Okay? And so you're going to get this board back at the beginning of Lab 11. Okay? At which point you will then solder the rest of the components on here, put it in your actual box, and, and create the system. So you go, hey, John, if that was lab 11, what happened to lab 8? Okay. Lab 8 is where you're going to do the software drivers. 
Now, hopefully, you don't get to the end of lab eight and you say, oh, I made a mistake in lab seven. <laughs> and I need more pins. I need, uh, you know, I need more chips. Uh, okay, let me just be totally, brutally honest. You will get the lab eight, and you will have made a mistake in lab seven. <laughs> There's no ifs about it. You will. So what we're going to do is we're going to mitigate those that risk here when we do lab seven. Okay. Uh, and we'll talk about it as we get closer. Right? And then in lab 11 is you do the, you do the construction and, and final testing. So hopefully, by the time you get past lab 8, you have a pretty good sense of, uh, and it's just putting all the pieces together. All right, so that's the essence of where we're going here in in this lab. Questions on that process? Nine oh yeah, nine, okay, yeah. Uh, lab nine is the Themister lab. Um, if you, uh, when I pass this around, this is actually a lab nine solution done in lab seven form. It's a thermometer. Uh, turn it on. Battery still works. So this is the this is a running lab uh, nine. Okay, uh, lab ten is a motor control. So we're going to do a PI. Uh, this is a DC motor with a tachometer um, that'll measure speed. We'll have uh, we'll have a Darlington transistor and pulse width modulated to control the power, and you'll spin the motor at a constant speed. So it's 362k done in in. On, on a real motor. So we'll do a control system. Great question. Any other questions? Yeah? When we get our board in lab seven? No, you don't get the board to lab 11. Oh. Because oh, okay. it takes a, you know, you turn it in and it's a due dates. You got to turn it in like three copies of it. Uh, initial copy, second copy, third copy. Just to try to reduce the amount of lot. You get it back in lab 11. But answer, yeah. When you get it back, Okay, so when we get it back, how do we flash the software on it? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, he said, how do I flash the software? And it turns out just like you flash the software now. Okay? Uh, if you look at your launch pad, and there's a little line down the middle. Have you seen it? Or let me do it another way. There are two, bar two big chips on your launch pad. One is your processor that you're programming on, and the other is... The other big chip on your on that board is the debugger. Okay, it's the JTAG debugger. That other big chip. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to take five wires, uh, five wires. Uh, when I pass this around, you're going to see it. You'll, you've seen it in Lab Six. There, there's a five-pin connector on your Lab Six. It's tied up to PC zero, one, two, and three. And we're going to take a five-wire cable from this board to the other board, and we'll program it with your launch pad. That's a good question. Yeah, because actually, uh, one of the choices you have to make is the processor. Now, uh, I'm expecting every, all 41 of you, all 41 of you groups, I'm expecting you to use the TM4C123. It's the most natural, it is the easiest, <coughs> Because you already know how to program, you already got lots of code. It's easy to debug. It's easy to program. And you know how to do it. Okay, but you don't have to. Um, but if you do choose a processor other than the TM4C123, you got to develop a way to debug it, to program it. And so we'll need to buy, you know, an ST Microsystems launchpad and an ST Microsystems chip, and hook them up. Uh, or an M MSP430 4 is an easy one. Uh, the processors are easy to solder. They come in dip form. Um, but you're going to need a way to program it. Okay, so that will be uh, an important... If, you ch if you're thinking about not using the TM4C123, you and I shall have discussions because I want to see that you can program it. You can develop it. All right. So... Um, yeah. All right, let's talk about the fun. The other way to think of your project is to divide it into three parts and say, uh, if, you're not, if you don't know what it's supposed to do, okay, a bottom-up thinker says, 
What can it have? Right? You, before, if you can do top-down design, that's fine. That's the right way to do it. Uh, but if you've ever been in my office, you know I'm a bottom-up thinker. And that is, I'm going to pile my office full of stuff, and then I'm going to build something out of it on Monday morning. Okay? And so that's the essence of this lecture. What can I, what can I put in it? Well, you know about the switches, right? Uh, and uh, as, this, as I pass this around, look at how the switches are, are attached slash uh, connected, and what do they look like, right? They're actually soldered right on the printed circuit board sticking outside my box, okay? No cables, no fuss, so the same switches we've been using, okay? Um, what if I want a keypad, okay? If I want a keypad, I want more than, I want 10 switches, I want 100 switches, okay? Then you're gonna go with a keypad, okay? Uh, so you can have a lot, a lot of buttons. Uh, you did sound output in lab five, you can have sound input with the microphone. Okay? Now you go, hey John, isn't this expensive? But maybe. Uh, while you're thinking about your lab seven, there is a lab eight, and I don't know why it's called lab eight, because it used to be lab eight. Uh, the bill of materials, and then the important, there are two important columns uh, on this. And the first important column is um, uh, the where to find it, okay? And if you see the word cabinet, okay, that means you come to my office and show me your SCH file and I give it to you, okay? So, it, so it, it, it's a cost to your bill of materials, but it's not an out-of-pocket cost. Uh, like this big, ugly, beautiful, well, that's redundant, that's a contradiction. This big box, okay? Uh, it, it's cost me five dollars, but you can have it if you want. Okay, uh, the and, but you can see that it's listed on here. Uh, it's the it's the one that's highlighted. Okay, uh, it's called box. Okay, and you can have it if you want. You know, it turns out a lot of the projects look like this when we're done. <laughs> and we'll talk about how boring that is next week when I teach you how to build the box that's beautiful, okay? Which also won't cost you any money. Uh, all right, so stuff, uh, so there's some stuff on here. Well, the microphone happened to be on here. It's not a very good microphone, but it was on there. Uh, now, accelerometers, I got a warning for you, is you can, you can get free parts, free three dimension, four dimension, six dimension, six degree of freedom accelerometers. Don't ask me what the other dimensions are. <laughs> Once you pass three, I don't know what four, five, and six are. I mean, you can get them, get them. The trouble is you can't solder them down because they're all, they have all of the leads on the bottom. And we're not going to run it through the oven for you. So unless you know how to run things in an oven, don't sample the free three, three degree of freedom accelerometers. Uh, now you can go to SparkFun and buy a three-dimensional accelerometer board. That's oh, that's not cheating, and and solder the board onto the other board. Uh, but if you want an accelerometer, I have a two-dimensional one. Now it happens to be completely obsolete, but I keep buying them because they're they're easy to solder. All their pins, it's not through hole, but all the pins are sticking way out. And you can get your soldering iron on them and solder them down. Because if you don't think about lab 11 when you're doing lab 7, you're going to be very, very sad. Okay? Because, uh, okay. So speaking of spark fun, again, speaking of bottom up design, uh, if you go to the spark fun and you go to the, go to the sensor page, there is a, a lot of stuff. Now, some of them is over budget. Okay? Some of them are over budget. But there's a lot of sensors out here which are which potentially would be fun to use. I've used I've used a lot of them. I my, my office is full of spark fun stuff. Um, so these are all things that you could connect up, and a lot of them are under budget. A lot of them are under budget. All right. I got one more website. In this this website you're gonna have to do quickly uh, because the stuff has to show up from China. 
but it's cheap. Now I can't, so if you Google sensor, okay. uh, not Google, search, yeah, here we go, come on, internet. Um, you will see a, a plethora of choices, um, temperature, distance, humidity, motion, etc. sensors. And the only difficulty is uh, you gotta, you gotta get on it and, uh, and wait for it to get here. Okay? But if you think about it, you should have it while you're doing lab eight because you need to, you need to uh, um, write software for it. But if you, uh, but if you uh, get on it, you can, you can get some of this stuff in the mail. Okay. Is an AliExpress kind of sketchy? Nope. Uh, he said, is it sketchy? Okay. I don't know what that means. I've been ripped off on AliExpress. Oh, have you? Uh, um, I, okay, so, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> it is not that, he said, is it sketchy? Um, stop, take, no. The, it's risky. No, it's risky. I, I can't, I can't, I can't deny it. Um, stuff may not be the same quality because uh, the reason why, okay, so now we can talk about ethics. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about ethics. What happens to, what happens to you if you download something from the internet and start selling it? If you just take, uh, take, a, take an iPhone Right? If you tried to mass produce iPhones, what would happen? I could, yeah, it's, uh, it's, un it's unethical. Okay, it's unethical to take somebody else's intellectual property and profit on it. Okay? Yeah, so maybe it's unethical to buy a designer handbag. He, he, he came up with a very interesting ethics. Okay? When you buy a, a, a knockoff uh, handbag or a knockoff uh, distance sensor, you know, who's, who's being unethical? Yeah, good, fair, good, 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 good question. I'll let you, uh, I'll let you, uh, look, if now if, oh, how about another one? Uh, if they're, you have to ask the question, why are they inexpensive, okay? <coughs> so they're either inexpensive because they're not paying their workers very much, Okay, so I ask you, where were your shoes made, right? Who made your clothing? Uh, and what workers were, were, yeah, we live in a very, very difficult time. Yeah, and we, uh, uh, and, and so if you're going to buy from AliExpress, I would encourage you to, to look at the ethics of it. Look at the ethics of it. Because I, I, don't, think it's, I don't think it's necessary clean from all aspects in terms of how they pay their laborers and where they pay for their intellectual property. Yeah, it's, it's, thank you. I, I don't deny the, the, I don't deny the, uh, the worry. But nevertheless, I do think you should get, have inputs because actually having inputs is a requirement, okay? So does it have a processor, it has to have inputs, it has to have outputs. We can play the same game with the outputs uh, LED cubes are fun. Uh, and there's lots of, uh, of, of, of web pages out there to show you how to manufacture an LED cube, how to get the, get the LEDs to all line up and sit up in, the, in a cube. Um, uh, be careful of the current because it turns out in order to interface these things, we're going to scan it. And uh, so if you think you're... Um, uh, if you think an LED takes one milliamp to run and you put 10 of them across, that driver is going to need 10 milliamps and then you scan it 10 down, that driver is going to need 100 milliamps. So there is a squared term between the number of rows and the number of columns in terms of how the current multiplies. Uh, but nevertheless, 100 is not is not uh, outrageous. Uh, 100 is not outrageous. Uh, there's three LEDs in the kit. Uh, two of them, three of them are low power. You can hook them right up to the microcontroller. 
Uh, two of them are higher power and you'll need a driver. Right? You'll need a driver for the orange one or the blue one. Uh, you did sound. Uh, don't go with a crappy speaker. You know, that's probably, if you're doing sound at all, let's spend all your budget in the speaker, you'll be happy. On the other hand, you should go stereo, okay? Uh, the other thing you want to do in this, in this lab is to figure out uh, what grade you want in your other classes. <laughs> oh, I was just saying. <laughs> and hopefully you and your lab partner are on board with whatever that answer to that question is. Um, do you have to go stereo? No. But if you want it to sound really awesome, go stereo. Um, solid state relays are well within the budget. If you want to flash stuff on and off, go solid state relays. That turns on things that are powered with uh, 120 volt AC. Uh, displays, at this point, I think we've settled into a wonderful, low cost, not that large, colorful display. And so my expecting is, I'm expecting most of your uh, projects to use the display you've got. Uh, if you hook up that other wire, it also comes with an SD card. Uh, left over from old days, I've got the standard uh, ASCII character LCDs, uh, which you can have. We went through a Nokia stage. You know, it's, uh, if you have to buy another display, it's cheaper. Um, in checkout is this Kentec, um, and it's a pretty not. I don't know, it's a pretty big display. Um, it's got touch. It's got a touchpad. Uh, it uses virtually every every pin on the on the controller uh, because it's parallel, not serial, um, and it's unreliable. So if you wanted a, and we're not, we won't give it to you. You have to if you check it out, you got to return it. Uh, but it is a bigger display. Uh, with with touchpad, yeah. Question. Um, great question. He said, "Do I need to buy another one?" You'll have two options. One, and it has to do with whether. Let, let me just pass this. Me, when you look at this one, look at how I've hooked it up. Um, it, the question is, should I spend another twenty dollars or not? It was the question. And you're, I'm going to give you two options. The most reliable construction is to solder the one you've got right onto the PCB. So uh, when you look, so if you get your board back, there'll be 10 holes right down. You're gonna solder it right there forever. Okay? But now it's there forever. Because you can't unsolder it without making a huge mess. Uh, actually, we're gonna solder it on the bottom side too. That's the other thing you should look at. The second option, option is put a socket, put a female socket on the board and put um, uh, standoffs on the other two sides. So you got two standoffs socket on the other side and then you can screw it on, plug it in, screw it on. Now the consequences of that is this socket will be unreliable and so when it's checkout time you're gonna have to do a lot of wiggling to get it to come on. Um, uh, your box will be higher because now you need to have space for it. But I do have 556 uh, risers, which will go in the other two corners. Oh, he said, oh yeah, no, great question. Oh, I, there are LCDs out there, okay, that aren't on boards, and that would be absolutely horrible. Uh, well outside of the bounds of this particular class to try to interface an LCD without the driver chips to this microcontroller because that's as complicated as, as your microcontroller already is. And now if you had a cell phone and you were trying to reduce cost, that's how they do it. But they, they, they use a microcontroller with the LCD driver in it and they spend millions of dollars and not seven days, two guys doing it for the first time. So I strongly, I mean, I will, I will not let you put an LCD on your project. You must buy a LCD already attached to a board that has an interface that is compatible with our microcontroller. Yeah. Uh, 
Now, I don't care if you don't use these three, but I want you to buy a board, uh, you know, buy a board that it fits. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, let's go. All right, so uh, wireless is wireless. So, you know, remember there are three, there are three, uh, well, there's a bunch of requirements. Uh, they must have inputs, it must have outputs, it must have a microcontroller, it must be in a box or in some sort of thing. It doesn't have to be wireless. Uh, one of the reasons I moved lab, swapped Labs 4 and 10 was to get you thinking about wireless, because it's kind of fun, especially if that's what you wanted to say on your, on your resume, uh, especially if uh, that's what you want to talk about in your statement of purpose to grad school. Now there are uh, three ways to be wireless. Okay? Uh, Zigbee is actually the lowest power. Uh, because uh, these guys here take well up into the 70 to 100 milliamps, these Wi-Fi chips. Zigbee's lower power, and they, uh, you can get them from checkout. Okay, so uh, we have the connector, so you can put a Zigbee on your, on your board. You have to return the Zigbee module at the end of the semester, or you could buy it, I don't care. Um, and it's simple. Uh, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, okay? Or, you know, so if you have a system with multiple microcontrollers in it, all trying to communicate with each other, Zigbee's a good, good approach. Now you did lab four, so you know exactly what it is. Uh, if you think about how it is you're going to do it, you're going to have to put the put the you have to put the male pins to the CC3100 on your board, so you can plug in the CC3100 onto your board and wire it up just like you did. That's that's possible. Um, and the, the third option is the ESP8266. Uh, if you're thinking about which should I go, go ahead and download uh, this uh, example, uh, this ESP8266 example for the TM4C123 and compare the complexity of the, of the drivers. Okay? This does everything, you want, everything that we did in Lab 4. We fetched from the internet, and we could have pushed to the server, uh, but it's a lot smaller, and uh, um, and they're sold on eBay. So go to eBay to see them. And as far as I can tell, this is this is an ethical this is an ethical thing because this is a product developed in China by Chinese people, and not developed in Europe and stolen by people on the other side of the planet. So I do believe this is an ethical thing to buy. Uh, questions on wireless? Not required, but fun. You know, it's, uh, now, the, if you're going peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, you do have the option of, of laying out a PCB with a TM4C123 on it, and then using your launch pad as another node. Okay, so you can have multiple processors as long as one of them is on a PCB board in a box, embedded and does things. If you have a second processor that you want, um, uh, you can use the launch pad as a second processor, as long as most of the cool stuff's on here. Okay? <clears throat> We've been doing this all semester. How do you test? How do you test? How do you test? This is where you're going to. Um, this is where you're going to anticipate the mistakes you make. Okay? And so there will be. To, uh, there's two common mistakes. Uh, well, three. Let's go three common mistakes. Things that are connected that shouldn't be. Okay. That's the first mistake. And the way you're going to mitigate that error is don't use a ground plane. If you don't use a ground plane and pins are connected that shouldn't be, you're just going to take a knife and cut it. Okay? That's what you're going to do. Things that should be connected that aren't, okay? the way you're going to deal with that one is vias. Okay? Every time you have a via, a via is a symbol, is, is a connection from the bottom to the top. What does the via create? A hole. A hole. And you can put a wire in that hole. Okay. I mean, it's not pretty, but you put a wire in that hole, solder it in, and then you can put the wire to some other hole, solder it in over there. Now you've made a you made a connection that didn't exist. 
trying to get a Y, getting trying to solder onto a trace that doesn't have a via is hard because it's it's got a mask on it. The copper is, is only exposed, well the tin is only exposed at the at the holes and not along the traces. And so in order to, to add wires later, we're gonna make sure we don't miss the vias. And one way to and one way, uh, a nice big hole are test points. And I don't know how many times I've used my test points as fixes. I was supposed to test it there, but a big hole I put a wire in. I can put two wires in a test point, it's so big. Okay? Um, and so now, what do I do with, it? let's say you don't use PD6. What do you do with PD6? Bring it out to a via, because you might need it later. What if you want to add a whole, uh, I've done this, a whole extra chip. A whole extra chip. Well, I get out a little board and I solder the chip onto the board like you did in lab five, right? Remember that little chippy thing you did in lab five? You soldered it onto that surfboard. And then I'm going to solder those wires onto my views. And I'm going to add a little board, a daughter board. It's actually got a name. It's, people do it so much. It's called a daughter board, a board on top of the board. So you're going to make mistakes. So deal with it. Uh, make, sure you, make sure you have at least two ground v, uh, test points so you can use one of them for a fix. Okay. Uh, this logic analyzer header that's in the starter code will actually plug right into your logic analyzer. So you know it's a nice way to test. Uh, you can use the LCD for debugging, but I'm not the LCD, the SDC. So you could do data logging and just write files to it. it just takes one pin on your liquid crystal display and now you have the SD card. So make sure you can deal with the, the, the errors that you will have. Uh, everybody comes to my office, doesn't fit. I got too much stuff. I got, went to Spark Fun and I bought everything. <laughs> and now it don't fit. Now you're probably not going to run out of analog pins because that's a lot of analog pins. Mm -hmm. Probably going to run out of input-output pins. Okay, uh, you could run out of SPIs. Uh, you could, if you run out of SPIs, you can create an SPI or a UART with regular pins. You just go pin goes high, pin goes low, pin goes high, pin goes low. I'll ask it on the final exam actually. Right? If you think about the DAC that you interfaced in Lab Five, you could have done that without the SPI, right? Three outputs. You set the digital pin low. Right? You set the, right? You set the, the frame select low. And you can do that, right? You just write to the port. Goes low. And then you set, uh, you set the data pin to D15, okay? And then what do you do? You set the clock high and low. Okay? And then you set it to D14. And then you set the clock high and low. D0. Then you set the clock high and low. And then you set this thing high. Now did I create a um, did I create a 50% duty cycle clock? Is the clock 50% duty cycle? No, I don't care. It's synchronous, remember? Remember how this works? It uses, and I forget which one. Actually, mine would work either way, whether on the rising or the falling edge. So I'm just going to guess. And if I guess wrong, I apologize. Uh, the falling edge to, set to, to specify the setup and hold time. So as long as you satisfy the setup and hold time, this will work. And I didn't actually use the SPI, I just used software. It's called uh, bit banging. So you can use, you can't do it with I squared C, that's way too hard. Uh, you can't do it with CAN or USB, U I squared S. You can't do it with any of the hard ones. But you can do it with SPI and UART, basically to mimic the protocol in software. Well, 
What if you need lots of outputs? Now, what in the kit, in the uh, bill of materials in my office, there are two chips. One's a 70, um, uh, 74, 595, and these are 165. This is shift registers. So we're either shifting it in, and then it produces outputs, or we're shifting it out and it's inputs. So you can chain these together. Put if you have uh, if you put uh, you know eight of these on your board, that's 64 outputs. And you use SPI to interface it, or 64 inputs, or 64 inputs and 64 outputs. Now, uh, do you know how much we paid for the processor? The actual chip? They gave it to us. We didn't pay anything for it. So if you need more pins, and you, and, and you don't care about your grades in your other classes, you can put two processors on the board. Now you've got to hook them up with a UART or SBI or whatever so they do something. Uh, my advice is put them on the same side of the board so it'll go through the oven, right? You put one on, go through the oven, put one on, the other one falls off the bottom. Put the two processors on the same side and we'll put it down. I don't care. It's not the, it's not the, if you come back and you say you need two processors, I'm first going to talk you into doing something simpler, by the way. Um, we mentioned that we can scan things. Okay. Uh, enclosures, big box, uh, wood box. I ordered the, I ordered the, the acrylic. So, I'm going to give out pieces of acrylic to make a box like this. I bought this one at Michael's. Uh, and so uh, next time we're going to talk about, well, next time Professor Bart, on Friday, Professor, okay, on Wednesday, we have an engineer coming in from uh, Innovations. If you want to work at an embedded system company, uh, there's one guy who, who will be doing the talking, and the other guy's a big boss. So introduce yourself to the guy named David and talk about what it is to do embedded systems as a career. Uh, listen to the other guy about how to lay out. And then Friday, Bart is going to talk about, um, about how to manage your power. Okay? Whether you come in from a wall wart or you come in from a battery, we're going to need a regulator to, uh, to, to, get, it, to get your 3.3 volts. And so you've been measuring the current on your systems over and over again. And what I made you do that in labs three and five, just so you get a sense of how much current your system's going to need. Uh, questions? <laughs>